you. Let's see if you've said enough. Hi. It's great to be with everybody. Um, I'm going to bring up a, a couple images quickly. Let's see. So um, you guys let me know if it's up. He's doing something. So it's an interesting time. And uh, it's interesting to be here at Oxford because uh, over in the Bodleian Library are the, um, the papers of Ada Lovelace. And uh, the correspondence that Ada had with Charles Babbage, you know, just like email there, I think there were nine postal deliveries a day uh, in the UK. So you can actually read it. And Stephen Wolfram, I call him the Nora Ephron of math. Um, he's this incredible uh, mathematician. He read all of them. And one of the things that he told me that Ada once said, and Ada, of course, is the first person to think of algorithms. Um, and, and we'll bring her up. But she said, I wish to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system, right? Darwin wrote about our past at the same time Ada wrote about our future. And the future she envisioned was a, a positive one. Now, the reality is um, we have the opportunity to use our collective genius because we've internetworked ourselves. And we can work with that collective genius like we're talking about here at school. And school is the ultimate place where this, can, you know, this is happening right now, right? Amongst us in our interconnections here and our digital connections to transform our systems, right? And so that's the opportunity. And what better place than human rights and bringing everybody? Like if we want to really solve everything, how about we just include everyone and they will together solve everything with us, right? So the challenge we have is we bring our whole selves, including some bad things, right? Humans have good and bad in us. This is an image that I want to get give that just faces, just to frame a little bit of some of the challenge side of this. So this happens to be a, a picture that Business Insider did for the US government. And they were looking at how the US Congress votes together or not. And what's really interesting to notice is that from 1953 on, the grayscale, it doesn't matter which party, you know, we are a two-party system, is in power. People are kind of working together. Not perfect, like any time. They're human too. Uh, but look at this, as, as we get into this cable area and then into the internet itself, we divide out. And so we're in these landscapes, no matter what country you go, what part of the world, we're in these landscapes that are pretty rough for not hearing each other. And so it's very easy to come into these spaces and propagandize people. We certainly saw that with the Cambridge Analytica and other things that are going on. So I also wanted to bring up this because it's a great resource. And there's a couple of resources we're going to hear from our amazing colleagues. Uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. This is a really excellent expose that, that Kathy O'Neill did. And I encourage you, just even watch her TED Talk. You don't have to read the book if you want to read the book. But diving into these algorithms that are being used for, by justice systems, for sentencing people, for choosing who gets the job, who gets the interview, who gets the loan, who gets the house. Like all these things, right? So we can really discriminate against each other. And this is not black box. It's dangerous to make it a black box. The other thing that I point out with her, it's not just the computer scientists who are in charge. It's all of us together. It takes a cross-functional team. Two data sets I want to show you that are especially uh, dangerous. One is uh, around sort of who gets to speak. And this is an example. Um, this particular one, I love the internet. People just do amazing things. And a group called Polygraph did this. Over here, do you see the blue? and then a little bit of red, that's men's lines to women's lines in children's TV. So we teach our children that men speak and women speak a little. So when we grow up, what do we make? Same thing, right? Because we would pattern what we learned as children. Men's lines to women's lines in 2,000 films. So do we want to train on this data, or do you want to have men speak, yes, and have women speak, too? Right, and as we get older, men get uh, more lines and women get less. So that's a challenge. Also, let's look at face recognition. So these cameras that we have in our pocket are incredibly racist. Have you ever noticed that you take a photo of somebody with white skin, it works great. Take a photo of somebody with darker skin, you have to light balance it? Who thought of that design, right? So Joy Bloom and Linny, if you haven't seen her piece, AI Ain't I a Woman, is an homage to Sojourner Truth's incredible uh, speech in 1851. Uh, Joy is an exceptional computer scientist that uh, Media Lab, and when she was doing some face recognition, it couldn't see her no matter what she did. So she put on a white face, and it saw her. So face recognition recognized this white man at about 99%, and women of color at about 77%. And that's dangerous, and it's unfair, and it's not right. And so we should make sure everybody's in the design team and that our data sets train against that. We also face this existential truth that, like, 
work is joyful, work is what we want to do, and people are afraid of the future, and we are thinking about AI. There's a wonderful new book called Big Nine, and what I want to point out here is what the Chinese government is saying. So Chinese government is saying in President Xi's speech, um, we would like to use, be the cyber superpower and use this to spread positive information, uphold the correct political direction, and guide public opinion and values towards the right direction, which to me sounds like the book 1984. So they are now doing a political, like a, a score, a social score of people. Like you cross the street wrong, your photo goes up. Right, so we don't want that kind of surveillance world and we don't want that kind of surveillance capitalism that um, the, the when we were just talking about the age of surveillance capitalism. So what do we want? And we're the ones, like we're the ones we've been waiting for, right? So how do we stay with that? And we have this weird situation. I always put two photos up because you can look at this challenge, like the world's or the future is here, but it's not evenly distributed. People say that all the time, but let's take a place. Do you recognize either of these places in the desert? What, what are they? Okay, Burning Man, the playa, what's this? It's a refugee camp. This is the Zatari refugee camp on the Syrian uh, border in Jordan. Now, they're kind of the same size and similar budget. One was made out of joy, one was made out of sadness. But why do we run one place one way and one place the other? Like, these people are being self-actualized. It assumes talent. And this place is really, you talk to refugees, they feel like they've been put in prison. They can't manifest their talent forward the way the structure of the system is. And so systems, not people, systems are cruel or kind depending on who you are. So could we use are these beautiful AI and algorithms in the spirit of ADA to really bring forth human rights and human capability? And how might we do that? Is it just one group that's supposed to do that? Or like, like a handful of sort of programmery people that I used to work with in Silicon Valley in charge of everyone? No. Right? So how do we change that? One of the ways you change that is stop having boring school and start having fun school and have 10th graders teach a chief of police how to code. This is happening in New Orleans. And they're working on use of force data, officer involved shooting, all the data sets around justice in the spirit of Ida B. Wells, one of the greatest ju justice scientists. And now we have communities of practice working across, using the internet to have justice. This is uh, Star Wars. Remember I sort of showed you the movies? This is Star Wars from 1977, Gender and Race. So that's Carrie Fisher's lines. And this is our current Star Wars. We're getting better. But we showed this to the teams that made those movies. They're like, oh, I thought we did better. So we humans are trying to include more, but we need some help and we could use AI for that. This is a project with USC. We're using face recognition, natural language processing, like Siri and Alexa, to analyze what we're making in movies before we finish the movie. So that we can make it more equal, more helpful, generate creative confidence for anyone. You know, so we don't have to have um, such biased media that accelerates some confidence because I get to see myself do everything or decelerate some things, everybody's confidence because I've never seen on screen. Today, uh, in family TV, it's 15 to one boy programmers to girl programmers that our children watch. Have you guys, uh, do you guys know Bletchley Park? So very near us, halfway to Cambridge and here, is where they crack the Enigma codes. Heroic engineering, fighting the Nazis, using mathematics. This is a movie called The Imitation Game that depicts that, and Turing and Joan Clark, they're real people. I walked in the Oval Office right after Prince William was there, and, uh, and, and I said, Mr. President, you know what you and I are about to do is related to Prince William, and he said, how's that? And we were about to do some coding, and I said, well, um, the prince's uh, uh, wife, the Duchess of Cambridge's great aunt and grandmother were code breakers at Bletchley Park. And I said, in fact, sir, uh, and he said, oh, I just saw that movie. He said, you know, sir, two thirds of the people at Bletchley were women. These are them, elite mathematicians. And he said, oh, the movie doesn't show that. I said, yes, sir, it's killing the economy. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it's interesting because even with the legacy of Kate, it's 25 to one boy visitors to girl visitors to this museum. Because computers are for boys, right? And they're for robots and self-driving cars and precision medicine, they're not for foster care and poverty and all these things, right? The farther back we can look, the farther forward we'll see and knowing about Ada and that she had this vision for us in the future and what we might do um, is really important. She's the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, great feminist born at the time of Mary Shelley, um, and that all of us are amazing. And so that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to hear a little bit of, as I started, this scary dystopia that's very real, please scrub in, 
uh, just like they did at Bletchley Park, we need everybody. But also there's this incredible future that our panelists are gonna uh, show us that's near future and it's now. And it's things you're doing. And every single organization that you are in should be using AI and data science and pulling in your 10th graders to help and adding it to you know, their homework. And that's happening in different places. And if you do that, then we'll have two things. We need to fight the bad, just like we do it in the analog world. But we also need to accelerate the positive in the digital world because it'll rebalance the data sets into what we care with our human values. Last thing I'll leave you with, she has cool hair. <laughs> Okay, so first up, uh, Elizabeth Hausler is gonna talk about uh, build change and built change. Come on up. Hi everyone, oh, it's great to see so many people in the room. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Elizabeth Hausler, founder and CEO of Build Change. Build Change is a systems change catalyst in the field of disaster, resilient, safe, affordable housing. Build Change saves lives by working with governments, engineers, builders, homeowners, banks to design, regulate, finance, incentivize housing and schools so they don't collapse in earthquakes and typhoons in Asia, Latin America, Caribbean, and most recently the United States and Puerto Rico. So housing, safe housing, is a basic human right. There are three billion people that will be living in unsafe housing, substandard housing by 2030. Three billion people, so that's a third of the entire global population. So our use of technology has been driven by the need to fix this, the need to address this basic human right of safe housing. So using AI, using VR, using uh, BIM software, using various technologies to be able to accelerate the possibilities of safe housing for all, to make it so no one dies in an earthquake or a typhoon. So I'm gonna show a video that illustrates what we've been doing uh, with AI and with some of these revolutionary uh, design tools uh, to retrofit houses there. So the 2015 earthquake devastated the country. Millions, millions and millions of people were affected. There were a lot of buildings that were damaged but not collapsed. And you can see they all pretty much look the same. The same geometries, the same building materials, the same problems, and the same solutions. But the government came out with a program where they were giving subsidies to only people that had completely destroyed houses, not just damaged houses. So we said, well, how can we retrofit these buildings? We came up with a retrofit solution that cost $3,000 to preserve an asset. It would take $20,000 to replace. But the problem was it took too much manpower, engineers, to go to the site, to measure the building, to do the calculation, to come up with a retrofit solution for each unique building. But we realize the buildings aren't that unique. And if we do the structural engineering, very good structural engineering up front, we can come up with a retrofit solution that works for any of these buildings, even though they have different geometries. And so we program that with our friends at Autodesk Foundation in their BIM software to be replicable to each type of building. So here's where the AI came in. The AI is a great way of us to expedite the assessment the go-no-go no go process. So we trained it to understand the differences between the buildings so that we could then rapidly come up with an engineering design, a bill of quantity, a cost, and ultimately where we wanna go, a very fast building permit. So the AI ran through many, many different iterations, and by the time we were done, it could recognize whether or not a building could be retrofitted, and we could blur the lines between actual photos and generated configurations of buildings. So we developed this app that the homeowner could use to crowdsource data, basically to upload a photo of their home, and then we could rapidly go through the go-no-go -no -go process to determine whether their house could be retrofitted instead of having to send an engineer to the site so that we could reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people with safe housing solutions. solutions. There are still thousands of buildings that need to be retrofitted in Nepal. But this is a way we can universalize access to, to the thousands and millions of people who live in unsafe housing. We are now implementing something similar in Colombia to retrofit buildings before the next disaster. Now, what does this also do? By facilitating fast design and assessment, we create more jobs for builders. We create more jobs for people who generally need an economic opportunity. This is a retrofitted house before and after. 
And this is a homeowner who had the choice between building a small one-room home or retrofitting her building. She's happy and safe as an outcome. So before I pass on, to my, pass on the mic to my colleagues, I want to talk about four groups of humans and how they interact with technology. Builders, engineers, homeowners, and government officials. So builders and engineers first. I'm both. I'm an engineer and a builder, so I have affinity for both professions. But after 15 years of beating our heads against the wall trying to find enough engineers, enough building inspectors to be able to do this work, we've decided, well, actually, we should probably try to automate that part. Because if we automate that part, again, if we make the design and the assessment more efficient, then we can focus on getting resources into the hands of builders so that more builders can have jobs. And again, we're normally working in a place where builders and construction professionals professionals need economic opportunities. Homeowners. So since day one, Build Change has been about empowering homeowners to make decisions about the materials and the architecture of their house, making it so they can drive the process. It should be their decision. There's all sorts of reasons in history why not including homeowners in this process is a bad thing. I'm not going to go into that here. But what I'm afraid of is by automating so much, we're going to take a step backwards in all this work that we've been, done, been doing to revolutionize the way, way, the way NGOs work in post-disaster contexts. To include homeowners, it's going to be erased by automating too much. So we've been using VR especially, a virtual reality experience, to enable homeowners to really see what their house is going to look like and be part of the decision-making process. The last point I want to make and the last group of humans I want to talk about are government officials. AI is not going to replace the need to make a tough decision and to allocate resources to solve a difficult problem. So we have been working with the World Bank who asked the question, um, after the 2017 hurricane season, which devastated a number of islands in the Caribbean, including Dominica, they asked, well, what would happen if the same thing happened in St. Lucia? So, and we've been working with them to use AI, Google Street View, and various different um, technologies to, first of all, determine, is the housing stock the same between the two countries? And can we train these systems to be able to collect enough information about the house to have enough information to be able to evaluate whether or not it's going to collapse? And then, are these buildings going to collapse? And we went through this process. And of course, the answer to all these questions is yes. Yes, the housing stock is similar. Yes, we can train these machines to collect the information that they need to make the prediction. And yes, the house is going to collapse. And I'm thinking the whole time, <laughs> have I become the crusty engineer <laughs> who thinks, gosh darn it, I know those buildings are going to collapse. I don't need a fancy AI to tell me that. Because we know these buildings are going to collapse. So the question is now, is this information going to compel action? Is this going to change the way priorities are made. Is the, is the government and the private sector going to actually retrofit these houses? So we need to make sure AI isn't a distraction from making the tough decision. And we need to bring all of these things together, just like Megan said. The homeowners, the engineers, the technology, the builders, the financiers, the political will not least to be, be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay, we are going to do one question. Oh, Come on. Okay. Okay, one question. Anybody or an insight or a thought or anything for Elizabeth? And uh, thank you very much. And it's, it's such a good example of such an important application, especially, did you see those houses? Like, just seeing what you could see if you looked in the right way together with tech and then do. Anybody with a question? No, they're quiet. Nobody. Okay, we can wait. All right. All right. Bavisi. You're, there's going to be more. Collect him. Um, Bavisi Nyongo. Nyani. Nyani. Yeah, come on up. He's... Uh, a fabulous AI yeah. evangelist, fabulous. and he's going to talk to us about that. Cool. <laughs> um, good afternoon. So um, today, I'd like to speak to you about a dance app. Um, behind me is a text sent by a user of the Vorsho dance app, which is a web app that uses AI-powered pose estimation from Google's TensorFlow library to parameterize and rate a popular South African gom music dance known as Ivorsho. The dance itself is infamous for its unrealistic demands on one's knees and its <laughs> requirements for near superhuman strength, 
which I will demonstrate now with your participation. But I'm going to need your help, okay? So um, I need a clap in this BPM, okay? Yeah. That's it, that's it, that's the whole time. I made it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the app was accessed on over 100 different device types during the December period in South Africa, including on this 26 pound model from little known phone manufacturer, MobiCell. Actually, to accurately tell you the story, I'm going to have to start from the beginning. Um, two years ago, I began working with the United Nations Refugee Agency Innovation Silo on a project known as Jetson. Jetson uses data science, statistical processes, design thinking methodology, and qualitative research to predict the movements of displaced people. With an initial pilot in Somalia, Jetson has underlined the importance of partnership, collaboration, and transparency. Led by the amazing talents of our colleagues Rebecca Moreno and Sofia Kiriazi, we used anonymized and disaggregated data by region. The predictors used by the model were suggested by either UNHCR field operatives or refugees themselves, and they included climate, weather, conflict, and historic population movement patterns. But as with any innovative effort, ours was not without its challenges. And the biggest challenge we faced was data scarcity. The reason was the machine learning processes we relied on needed monthly anonymized data from legally open sources to feed into models. And because we relied on multiple external partners for this data, we missed some of our monthly deadlines for displacement predictions with the ramifications felt on the ground. But ours is sadly not a unique problem. It's actually well documented that Africa lags behind when it comes to the collection of timely, accurate, and reliable data. These data gaps undermine efforts by stakeholders to target resources, to map policies, and to track accountability and they ultimately hinder innovative processes such as ours that rely on a democratic data economy. So, in the face of this adversity, we looked to ways to plug holes and we found proxies that could be used in lieu of our core value set. And one of the proxies we found was this guy. <laughs> UNHCR staff in collaboration with refugees discovered that the price of a goat would decrease relative to the number of people whose departure from an area was imminent. And what we actually learned was that families would sell livestock in preparation for a move from an area, and by so doing would saturate the market and lower the price of a goat. And by creating a virtual commodity trade marketplace in Somali refugee camps, we were able to assuage the limitations of our reliance on open data as we knew it. What this taught us was a very important lesson on what it really takes for this kind of technology to have an impact. The thing is, without the proximity to the perceived beneficiaries of our innovation, all our efforts would have met with a timely and uneventful end. One might even go further as to say that what our statistical proxies today might actually very well be the future of open data on the African continent. The truth of the matter is technology that fails to harness opportunities presented to it by the audience for which it is created will probably fail on delivering on the mandate appointed thereto. And with that in mind, I'd like to take us back to the story of the Dance app. So, after we discovered South Africans' willingness to interact with bleeding edge technology on a spectrum of device types, we decided to do more with the, with the algorithm. And we repurposed the dance app and we created a prototype for the early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. What this prototype does 
is it measures the relative position of a subject's limbs as they walk. It measures the rigidity of their torso, their gait, their posture, and the movement of their arms. And it gives an evaluation after three consecutive assessments over a period of time. <clears throat> and we already know from our dance app experiment that there is definitely a willingness on the African continent to interact with new technology as long as it is relevant. And when properly harnessed, mobile phones present a new frontier for data-reliant innovation, especially on the African continent, considering the fact that over 80% of Africans have access to or own a mobile phone. And as I stated, um, our dance app proved that as long as there is a context for the innovation, it will find an audience. Between death-defying dance moves and goats, <laughs> one thing is definitely clear. When it comes to AI innovation in Africa, convention is not your ally. And with that, I thank you. Oh, yeah, it's, it's so interesting, as Fabricia, to you pointed out, there's so many signals around us, and how do we see through the noise and choose particular ones? Does anybody have a question out there? Yes, no, or a comment, or a thought, or something you saw, yeah. I just wanted to know how you got the goat data. What, because you, were you able to tap into markets to find what exactly. the GOAT price was? So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have um, UNHCR field operators on the ground, work within the refugee camps. So, through partnership with the refugees, um, it was discovered that there were certain proxies that we could use that could plug the gaps that open data um, had left open. Yeah, it's interesting, during the Ebola crisis, there's a company called Premise that uh, sadly was able to tell where Clorox or bleaches were being bought off the shelf in particular locations, and you could move aid and support to those neighborhoods to see if you could help. So there's a lot of proxies. I know of a company that uh, looks at hedge fund work and just sees how many cars in our parking lot to see how well a company's doing So there's a, and how it changes. <laughs> so there's a lot of data out there, signal to noise. And the, the big question, there's a question back here, the big question also is, as we talked about, or do we have the will to do something with it? Yeah. You know, and also do we, uh, are we going to um, also take care of the privacy that we do, like with your gate walk? Some, some yeah. countries would use seeing yeah. how you walk to save Parkinson's, and some countries or places would use that to identify who you are and do something negative. Yeah. I just wanted to see him throw it. <laughs> so, awesome. I'm curious, as we talk about technology and these leaps, how did you get from a dance app to Parkinson? Because if uh, we think about transferring technology to solve problems, it's all about how do you make these leaps from A to B, which most folks wouldn't think about putting together. Exactly. So for us, like the dance app was just a fun experiment. Pose estimation on mobile devices is like, it's using the most recent iteration of AI because it uses uh, what are called tensors that are extra layers on top of traditionally trained models that are able to be used on, for example, a, a mobile phone, just harnessing the phone CPU. So with the dance app, we were able to make a, a fun iteration of this um, understanding of your posture and the position of your limbs and what can be done with it. But then um, looking at the current methodology for diagnosing Parkinson's now, it's also very symptom symptomatic. Um, what uh, medical practitioners, practitioners will do is they will assess um, some of the parameters that our app will look at. Um, that leap for us was more how to make more meaningful technology considering the number of devices we know it can run on and how this can be received by the communities we want to include it in as long as there is context for it. Um, it wasn't really informed by some like, crazy smart thing. It was just, what can we do with this dance now that we can do this? Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? I think I go? We'll, we'll go more questions. I, we'll go, we'll, we're going to bring all of these guys back up cool. at the end. We'll do a couple more. Thank you, Babutsi. All right. Next up, uh, Dunstan Alistair Hope. Alison Hope is uh, Managing Director of BSR, which is Business for Social Responsibility. Come on up. Thank you. 
Um, so two disappointing things to start with. I'm not going to dance. And my talk is fairly short, so it's going to rely on uh, questions from you. Um, but if you want to use a dance app to uh, diagnose if I've got Parkinson's, let me know afterwards. That would be most welcome. Um, so I work with an organization called BSR, Business for Social Responsibility. We are um, an international uh, nonprofit organization that works with uh, 250 of the world's largest companies on a full range of different um, social and environmental issues. So we work on human rights issues, climate change, women's empowerment issues, quite a, a diverse range of, of topics. Um, my focus has been mainly on technology and human rights. And what I want to share with you today are three key points that we are using to inform our work with, at the moment, mainly technology companies on human rights and artificial intelligence. So the first point I have here is that human rights-based methodologies offer a robust framework for the responsible development and use of AI and should form an essential part of business policy and practice. Now that sounds like a very, very obvious statement, doesn't it? Um, but in the conversations that we have, that's not necessarily the case. And what's been striking to us over recent years has been the focus on ethics and human rights. You'll hear a lot about, sorry, I misspoke, ethics and artificial intelligence. You'll see a lot of discussions and debates around the ethics of AI. And that is very good. It's important to discuss issues of fairness, of discrimination, uh, of justice. Those are all very important topics to get into when thinking about designing and developing AI. But we feel that human rights-based approaches provide something very robust. Um, it grounds artificial intelligence and the development and use of it in international human rights law and international human rights standards. So what we're trying to do is work with companies to think not just about ethics, but about human rights and what um, artificial intelligence means for them. Second point is that companies, organizations outside the technology industry have an essential role to play and should be much more proactively involved in the development of responsible approaches to AI. Again, another statement that sounds quite obvious. Um, but it's been very interesting to witness over recent years the emergence of lots of different organizations working on ethics or human rights and artificial intelligence and the way in which the companies at the table in those organizations are almost all technology companies. It will be Google, it will be Apple, it will be Microsoft, it will be IBM. It's very much focused on the technology industry. And there's a lot of scrutiny, quite rightly, around the work of technology companies in AI. But when we work with these technology companies to think about human rights in AI, we very quickly focus on the use phase. How is that AI going to be deployed? For what purpose, by what companies, in what industry? And very quickly, we actually have to start thinking about human rights issues in other sectors. And so what we would like to see are companies in the retail industry, in logistics, in transport, in financial services, paying the same sort of attention to issues of human rights and AI that the technology industry um, is grappling with themselves. And we've deliberately used the phrase here, companies and organizations. I think it's as important for nonprofit organizations, civil society organizations, um, on social entrepreneurs to think about the human rights uh, opportunities and risks that are attached to AI. And then the third and final point is the one that I was most um, afraid and nervous of making in terms of having to describe it. Um, innovative methods of human rights due diligence are needed to uncover blind spots, imagine unintended consequences, and anticipate a highly uncertain future. I was nervous about making this point in terms of how to convey uh, the message I'm trying to convey here, but then attended the plenary session last night. And we had that great talk about futures methodologies and future scenarios. That's exactly what we're trying to do with companies on human rights and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a sustainable futures lab that uses very similar methodologies to the ones described yesterday to stimulate dialogue and discussion with companies about the future. What are, the, some, of, what are some of the potential unintended uses of AI? What things might seem crazy now, but could actually be a very common feature of our future, where we, we, need, we need to make decisions today about how to address human rights because of the implications that they'll have in 5, 10, 15 years' time. And so we've been trying to deploy some of the similar methodologies that you heard yesterday to open up the conversation, uncover blind spots, and really broaden our horizons about uh, some of the risks and opportunities that exist with, with AI. 
I have no idea how many minutes I've just spent talking, but I think it was less than my allotted time. Okay. And I would love some questions. Any questions for Dunstan? Yeah, back there. Okay, you got a big toss. <laughs> and here. Um, three words, you'll find the answer. China, human rights, AI. Hmm. <laughs> that is the toughest question. Um, so, well, you'll read, I guess it came up Maybe in your opening introduction oh, as well. <laughs> I think I, I attended before this session a discussion on ethics and decision making. And I think the China case presents a very difficult challenge because there are all sorts of uh, things underway in China that will present very extreme risks to human rights in terms of the use of facial recognition and AI. And so for the companies we work with, the question is often, should they be present in China? And if so, how are they present in China? And you're seeing that play out right now with controversies around Google and Microsoft and other companies in terms of how they operate in China. And I myself haven't reached a conclusion as to what the right um, avenue is. What is the right thing for a company to do in terms of whether to operate or not in China? What I do know is if and when they do so, taking a very deliberate approach to thinking through privacy, freedom of expression, surveillance, child rights, non-discrimination, and how what they do in, in China or other countries has an impact on those issues is, is essential. Um, but it's, it's, in the way that you discussed in the opening, I think is, is a huge challenge. And we run the risk of, of very segmented approaches to how we deploy AI. And companies could choose not to operate in China, but a lot of Chinese companies will carry on doing what they're doing. And it's an interesting challenge of, um Again, there's two parts, like just think about this is digital, but it's also an analog, right? In our real world, we behave like this too. How do we address it? We do two things. One is we directly address it. So we have to work on that. Perhaps it's through um, making laws and rules, and maybe some other countries are going to break them, but we can have ours, and we can work towards that, and we can work towards international shaming of certain kinds of behaviors. Um, and then this, this work that we have to do to get the flourishing of the more positive stuff, especially our nonprofit sector, to have CTOs and techies inside of their orgs. There's a lot of people who suffer in the tech sector wanting to work on these topics, but they can't get a job here because the organizations don't realize they need those people. And so there's a real opportunity to really flourish the positive, to really accelerate that while we also directly combat the negative. That's a question, by the way, I think. Yeah. We way back. Okay. We have to have two tosses. Somebody help. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! What's up? Okay. Hi, I'm William Perrin. I'm a trustee of Carnegie UK Trust. And we're a very old school think tank. We've been around over 100 years. And we saw this new AI stuff coming along and thought, well, do you need um, a whole set of new laws and new ethics discussions when we already have really good laws Thank that you. could apply to this if you uh, think a little bit imaginatively? So I applaud your approach. And in the UK, we we work with a legislator to put down a question to the government to say, well, when you deploy AI in the workplace in the UK, is that covered as a tool or machine in the 1974 Health and Safety at Work Act? Mm -hmm. And they came back within 48 hours and said unambiguously yes. yes. So there you are. You have a, a perfectly good traditional law, well proven, that is seen to apply to AI. And I strongly urge people, before they engage in what are actually quite weak ethics exercises that wouldn't pass academic muster in, in many institutions, to look at the existing law set, to work with your legislators to say, should this apply to AI? Can it? And how can we frame it in such a way such that AI is not some special magic thing, it is just a new technology yes. and should be regulated with the, the wider set of technologies we have so it doesn't inadvertently cause social harm. Yeah, thank you for that. And it, it really underlines, Dunstan, what you led with in the very beginning of trying to take the human rights that we have and get these companies kind of pull these into the conversations. Any other things you would add to that? So one statement to agree with you and one statement to build on it. So. Uh, We'll be asked the question quite often, should AI be regulated? And I will answer somewhat along those lines, that actually uh, you need to look at regulations industry by industry, issue by issue, and there are many regulations that are already there that need to be applied in, in a new setting. Uh, there are places and times where they might need to be updated or clarified. So um, is facial recognition a form of data processing? Right? So if you've uploaded your photo onto various sites, it might say this can be processed in, in certain ways. Does, is facial recognition covered by that term or not? There are places where 
certain interpretations need to be made of existing laws, but I agree with the premise of the question. Do I throw I this back now? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah? we okay. have to go. We go, uh, I think we have, maybe we can, we have, we have to watch out on time. Let us hold this, hold this question, but remember them because we're going to have another space. We have our last uh, speaker to bring us home. Tanya O'Carroll is at Amnesty International, and she's the director of Amnesty Tech. Um, so hi, this is in some ways perfect. The danger of going last is always that uh, you're going to just repeat everything that's come before. But I think in this case, actually, it really does, um, it's highlighted that there is an elephant in the room, and it actually hasn't come up, so I'm really pleased about that. Although I also feel disappointed that yet again I am the person arriving to the party, the dance party, and turning off the, the, the uh, music and being like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so in the AI space, I have been um, working on this at Amnesty for a number of years. <clears throat> and there seems to be two big frames or discourses that are the dominant discourses. One, AI for good, and lots of people get together and have really exciting and incredible conversations and are doing amazing, innov innovative things. And it feels like that's a whole field that's thriving and, and very exciting. And then over here, we have this whole uh, frame around AI ethics. And I'm in regularly in spaces, same as Dunstan, with many of the companies and the partnership on AI and many academics and others trying to think about these really tough ethics questions. But neither of them are addressing this really big question in the center, which is about power. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'll, before I get to the elephant, just very briefly, um, within, a, within Amnesty, how I've come at this is so on the, on the AI ethics side is we've been um, working for about two and a half years to do exactly what Dunstan was talking about, which is really bring a human rights framework. One of the resources that's just good for people to know about is called the Toronto Declaration, and it was launched uh, last May by Amnesty Access Now, and I've got about 30 other signatories to that. And interestingly enough, while all of the companies, or many of them, DeepMind, Google, Microsoft, others, turned up to the drafting of that, not a single one has signed on, despite all of our advocacy. And the, the feedback we had varied from, it's just not fun enough. The, the language is just not positive enough. Um, we were like, it, it's human rights law. It's really quite dry. <laughs> not much we could do about that. But it was interesting to see that they, did, they weren't really willing to actually bind themselves to the, the norms that they just technically should already be binding themselves to. Um, and then the other side, we are doing a whole bunch on AI for good. So I really am a believer in, in the positive uses of technology. In the last year, we've done three pilots um, using automation and machine learning directly in the human rights monitoring process. So one of them was Decode Darfur, essentially helping to train an algorithm to identify burnt villages in Darfur by using the power of amnesty activists, the same ones that used to write letters for us, and now actually training uh, and labeling data um, as part of a microtasking uh, initiative we have called um, Decoders. The second one, we did uh, some um, natural language processing with a partner called Element AI in order to create a model that predicted abuse against um, women, journalists, and politicians. And then the third one around monitoring executions and use of the death penalty worldwide by ingesting media articles, analyzing them, and interpreting them in order to help us uh, publish our statistics every year. So again, believer in all of this. But to the elephant. The elephant in the room is the current business model. And the reason this is important is because the data, the way that it's captured, the way that it's harvested, ingested, exploited, mined, without people's consent, in order to not only predict their behaviours, but to influence the actions that they take, is one of the biggest and most existential threats that we face as society. And it has to be central to any discussions that we're having on, on AI. It's really interesting that within the AI debate, very often we see it as a technical issue, right? So there's the... Um, there's the dirty data, that's all of the polluted, bad, biased historical data that Cathy was talking about. And then there's the black box that none of us understand. And then you put dirty data in black box algorithm and out comes human rights abuse or bad algorithm. And so naturally, lots of clever people get together and go, OK, well, let's fix the dirty data. Let's depollute it. Let's clean it up. Um, and let's think about how we get around the black box by auditing algorithms, by having more transparency, and therefore we'll be able to see the outcome. These are all good things. They should happen. They, they, I, whether they will happen in, in, by companies and whether that actually need to be legislated to ensure that happens is another question. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really get at this question as to why is the data being... Who is collecting the data in the first place? Why is it being collected? What is the consent under, underpinning all of that? It feels to me a little bit like we're talking about the cherry 
on the cake a huge amount, which is the algorithm. And how does it look? How does it taste? And then we start talking a little bit about the ingredients that go into the cake. That's the data. And we're missing the fact that the cook is just a psychopath. And no one's talking about it. And nobody wants to eat that cake. Um, so just moving, uh, this is about power. This is about politics. This is about asymmetries of power that are age old. They go way, way, way beyond the internet. Um, Google, just to take a really quick example, you know, currently billions of search queries every year, every day, sorry, billions of, um, of uh, YouTube clicks, 1 billion active Gmail users, t uh, estimates of 25% of Google traffic, uh, of internet traffic, sorry, in, in the whole of North America goes through Google servers. Google is not just connected to the internet. Google is the internet for many, many people. Take Facebook, it's even more so. In many countries, Facebook Zero is the interface that most people have to the internet. Um, there is nothing else. They did some interesting uh, surveys and polling in some African countries and Southeast Asian countries, and they found that lots and lots of people were saying that they were not internet users, but they were Facebook users. And they were like, well, how do you explain that? And it's because a lot of people just didn't realize that they are accessing the internet because Facebook is it. And what kind of internet is it that they're getting? I mean, the last year, two years, has just told us, I think, everything we need to know about this. Um, what kind of internet is Facebook. Uh, two years ago, we have the, the scandal where they, we find out that they're trying to actually actively influence our emotions and moods by tweaking the algorithms in terms of what content we get. Um, one of the biggest psychosocial experiments that there's, there's been with absolutely no consent. Uh, second one, Cambridge Analytica. I'm not even going to go into it because we could talk about it forever. What's interesting is that it's still referred to as a data breach. This was not a data breach. This was Facebook operating exactly as Facebook was set up to operate. Um, they, they shared data with third party, and they just got caught out. And that's what's really happening here, um, influencing voting. And then recently, two months ago, you might have seen the story about uh, Facebook has been paying teenagers aged 13 years old, 13 to 17, as well as others, $20 a month to essentially install what is equivalent to spyware on their phones that allows f Facebook to harvest every single interaction that these teenagers are having um, with their friends in order to influence them again. So these, this question of the data monopolies, this question of the power of these handful of companies is massive. It's massive to your point, Babusi, which is about if the, if the data is sat behind this walled garden, um, between, behind this fortress walls, then the R&D for our future is also behind that walled, those fortress walls. And how are we supposed to be, you know, you, you were saying that there's not, um, it's difficult to, to, to track migration patterns. Facebook, if they were to provide that data, perhaps has tons and tons of inf interesting information that we could use, but they're not interested in solving the problems that we're interested in solving. And this is one of the major problems. So just to end, we have to move beyond talking about AI for good and AI ethics. That's without a doubt. Um, and while the initiatives are important, and while I take your point, yes, we need to be creating positive models, um, Cathy, for what this looks like. We cannot build just equal and fair automated systems on top of a corrupt, toxic sludge. We have to tackle the business model. And it's a little bit like talking about. <laughs> Yay! It's a little bit like talking about climate change, as, as we had for, for about two decades, where we focused on citizen action turn off the light switches, get some solar panels, conserve water. We now know, if we don't take action, that you know, the world is genuinely in serious peril, and it's political action that is needed. And just as, as in the digital world, we need political action as well. So every time you hear AI for good, if you could really push data as a public could, I think that would start to change the conversation. AI ethics, AI ethics, let's debate them, let's discuss them, it's positive, but really what we need to be talking about is rights-based regulation. And then the biggest challenge, disruption. Everyone who's at Skull is a disruptor in one way or another. Let us be harnessing that disruptive spirit to actually disrupt the current business model of the internet. And then we can start talking about AI for good. So, fabulous. Yes, and I, I think that this is in this, this central point of like, if, you, if the product's free, you are the product. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are we gonna do about it? And also the, on the China side of the, Ch not the Chinese people, the Chinese government and what they wanna do in top down. Any quick questions or comments? Yeah, okay. Hi, thanks, that was, that was brilliant. 
a question on that last one about disrupting the business model. Mm -hmm. What would, if you had a magic wand that was somewhat realistic, what would that look like to you? Yeah, so, I mean, I'd, lo I'd love it if we could fix it with a magic wand, actually, because that would be Sorry. brilliant and save, like, four or five years of what I'm going to be working on. Um, but at least at Amnesty, we are currently trying to come up with um, really concrete proposals, because I think, actually, there is the fact that people applaud... I mean, people want change. I really believe that people want alternatives now. Um, people are angry, but we're not doing a very good job of giving them clear, concrete goals. Like, what does the fix look like? So I think there's some really interesting stirrings that are happening in the domain of antitrust, so breaking up the tech companies, but or breaking up the data, or, you know, making it... If data's a public good, then it needs to be primarily in the hands of our public servants so that we can access it as citizens, so that it is primarily benefiting us as citizens. I think all of this stuff around data trusts is really interesting and definitely part of the, the solution. Um, I think a right to opt out. I think we really have to start extending from the GDPR, like really thinking what does a right to opt out actually look like. Um, you, you should be able to use these services which are now essentially amount to the internet without having to accept pervasive surveillance if you don't want to. Um, and then the other, I think there's questions around um, the, how these companies pay in and the, the, the lack of taxation. So we're kind of looking at a model of uh, opt out, pay up, and break up, but you know, just small wishes like that. <laughs> yeah, and getting into the details right now, you know, all of us are experiencing the awesome move by the EU to take a step forward. It's still very, rude, you know, brute mm. force. Like yes or no? Like, are there any, you yeah. know, grayscale in here of how we implement cookies and other things? So very important to get into this. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I'm, I'm really glad you said what you said. It was really important. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm very interested in political intelligence. We help marginalised political actors access diplomatic processes. And for years I've been talking to a fellow in Silicon Valley who runs a big data analytics firm that's now doing AI analytics on big data. And he sold his technology uh, of political intelligence, which sucks up data from all over the world to make predictions about conflict, terrorist attacks, all kinds of extraordinary things. Yeah. He sold that technology to two main customers, the CIA and BlackRock, uh, yeah. which is one of the biggest um, hedge funds in the world. Yeah. Uh, and my worry is precisely what you've talked about, which is that AI is actually going to reinforce existing power differences, not actually expose, not uh, rebalance them, but reinforce them. And one of the critical questions for me is access to the AI technology. You've talked about access to data, but yeah. how do we ensure that the technology is actually more <laughs> openly available? The open source people would say, you know, we help make uh, uh, software uh, uh, open source, but AI technology is, is, is very different from that. Mm. How do we ensure open access to that? Yeah, no, I totally take that point. I mean, really, it's technology is a public good in, in lots of ways. The, the, quite the point about the CIA, I mean, I remember my um, cyber law professor about 12 years ago giving an impassioned speech about how Facebook was, you know, had built what the NSA could only have dreamed of building in its wildest, in its wildest imagination. And what, that was 12 years ago. I mean, compared to what it looks like now, and I think after the Snowden moment, we had this, this thing of, oh gosh, you know, all the data that the NSA or CIA or GCHQ might have about us, and we focused on the governments. And what's interesting is that actually the corporate uh, amassing of that data is the same thing as the government amassing that data, because the gov the, inevitably it is shared with governments. And on top of that, it's a little bit like, um, somebody I know says this a lot, it's, it's a little bit like asking, would you rather be punched in the head or punched in the stomach? You're still being punched. <laughs> so I think, yeah, there's a huge amount that we have to do to... And these are big questions, but I think it starts with raising them, talking about them more, outing the elephant every single chance you get. Yeah, and also, uh, I don't know if these guys have the image of it, but um, if you guys have been tracking uh, in Singapore and uh, Korea, there's a group that's done DQ. I always talk about TQ, Tech Quotient. Make sure you have somebody with TQ in your team and build yours. But DQ, it's a little bit small to read, but uh, this is a proposal that's coming out of uh, parts of Asia for everybody around digital literacy that we would have. So there's kind of, again, two sides of the coin. One is directly pushing and working on that. But the other is how do we include more people, scrub them into the design side? and the fluency side. And so um, this is, you know, what are the skills that every human should have around digital safety, digital use, digital identity, digital rights, digital literacy, digital communications, digital emotional intelligence, security. This is about bullying online. And uh, if you look at literacy, what I love about this particular proposal is that it's data and literacy. 
Uh, it's about computational literacy. Recode, you guys are in the room somewhere. Yeah, okay, so this is a Brazilian team that's out training. How many people have you guys trained? 1.7 million. Yeah, through the library, so just go for it. So again, this look for who already's got it and, and there. What I like here is it doesn't say some people get to learn Excel and everybody else over here is gonna learn coding. Like everybody should learn how to do digital arts and all these things and we should do it from when we're little. You know, Raspberry Pi, we're in the country of Raspberry Pi. You know, and the second graders can take these. It's the board from your phone, right? We can teach ourselves to be fluent in this stuff and use it for the joyful things that we've been talking about and slowly diminish this. And the business models, I think, are right in the heart of this, as well as their surveillance behavior of certain countries. And those two are coming at us. So what we want to do next is um, we're going to come up for a Q&A, but we actually have a method to make all of you guys a panelist, too. Uh, it's called popcorn. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take two minutes. And the question for you, we want to crowdsource because we've all flown here and there's a lot of knowledge in this room. So turn to your neighbor and discuss, tell us what is something you have seen that's actually promising, that's real. It's either something that, that is like a version of AI or something someone's doing about human rights or some combination of two. What is it that makes you hopeful that's real? It's not a post-it note idea, but it's really happening and you've seen it happen. And if you haven't seen anything, maybe uh, try to brainstorm with each other of what's out there. Okay, ready? You got two minutes each turn, turn to take turn, go. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, all right, so we obviously, we don't have enough time to go through the whole room, but we're going to do what we call popcorn is, which if there's something that your neighbor just said to you that you're like, oh my god, everybody needs to know this, uh, or if, if you want to either get them to say it or summarize for them, uh, or something you were thinking. So, and it has to be like Twitter length, OK? So we're going to get through about five or six folks. So who's got something that you think an insight, something we all could really use to know, and it'll bring us in a good direction? Way back, OK, we got a lot of hands, OK. Should we go way back? Way back, way back here and here. Those two, yeah. Slight, slight insight from my, my, my neighbor, Grace, but I kind of took it a little bit to the next step, which is around the strategy of international shaming, and how would you do that in the age of a Facebook or a Google? OK, but Would, you're not allowed to have something that you question. What, do, have you seen something that's already doing that? Uh, yes. Her what is it? Yeah, what are you doing? Your organization. Yeah, so, t Grace, tell us. Hi, I'm Grace. I, I run an organization called Walk Free. It's Thank an you. international anti-slavery movement. And I was just saying, I love the comment about systems change and attacking the system, not the cherry on top, because it's really all well and good for everyone to do something. It's important, but we need the biggest supply chains in the world to be doing something. We need governments to be responding. And are you doing something? And yeah, we've seen a massive shift in the last eight years from being locked outside the room, throwing stones, to now being in the room with Walmart and Nestle and these big supply chains, because they see the risks to their, themselves. Is Sally still in here? Sally Asperger's in here. She was saying, first they ignore you, then they, uh, then they mm. you know, dismiss you, and then eventually they fight you, and then they let you in. So yeah. you guys are on the path. All right, any other key insights, cool things? There was somebody right over here. Noreen, so, yeah, they go. Noreen yeah. Huni, um, working with children and youth, what we've realized is technology is, re is revising the way we quality care for children. Mm. It is almost displacing our parenting capacity and we're handing over to technology. Yeah, and that's now flip that, hold on. You got that. And, and you, could. hold on, you are doing something really interesting because I know you are, which is to change that into mental health. It's just say a sentence of what you are doing, uh, the work you guys are doing in schools around mental health, which is specifically addressing some of this. It's social, emotional well-being and helping the teachers and caregivers to look at children differently and instill and stimulate their internal competencies. Yeah, Self-esteem, confidence, know who I am, what I have, and what I can do. And you know, one of the things we got, to, we ended up at dinner, which is the serendipity school, and you were saying, you know, the child's sleeping at school. What does the teacher think of that child? Is the child bad? Is the child hungry? Is that child, but what is, you know, and how do we flip how we feel about that child? And how do we feel based on different characteristics of that child, yeah. a child of poverty, a child of different race from us? That, and how do we flip that? And you guys are doing that work in South Africa, which is favorite. What's the name of your organization? Repsi. Repsi. Other people, let's get two more, yeah. <clears throat> I'm really inspired by the use of AI to achieve energy efficiency. Um, I, we had a panel recently in which um, both um, citizen to citizen smart grids to be able to trade energy but in, in blocks and neighborhoods and then appliance level efficiency devices to be able to create an algorithm of how houses predictively use energy 
and thereby to optimize when you draw down and to be able to optimize the way power is used. And the combination of smart grids and, and device level optimization. The panel was saying could probably get us half the way to our climate goals if we just push on push on efficiency. I mean, yeah. we've got to do all the other stuff, but that was a source of enormous hope to It's me. really exciting. And like these little devices in your house, if you flip to that second chart, one of the things that was really great is when you add tech folks, TQ, and a government, uh, you, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, who are entrepreneurs and residents, came in and they, uh, they started doing Green Button and they went into the U.S. government, you can do this, lots of governments are doing this, and reveal privately for through login your energy data and then you can start doing things with it, with apps and others. This is uh, what we did with the Data Science Cabinet, which is where you ask in your government every ministry to deliver a data scientist to the cabinet. And then you can start to have a rubric. It's a bit of an eye chart, but um, you know, just like a project at school where someone's getting a high grade and they're doing well, all the way down to very basic, right? So give a rubric to your government and have people do that. Okay, I think we're gonna hop. We'll do one more right there. And then I want to get you guys. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you for uh, addressing the elephant in the room. I live in Egypt and our government just bought surveillance um, uh, to, to monitor everybody's Facebook. So please just think of Africa again as a place where there, uh, there's no proper governance of everything that you are discussing. There's no, nobody, uh, actually they're enforcing laws to do more of that and right. you have corporations and governments uh, in the West that are helping that happen. So the, I think the conversation here is very advanced for Africa. Africa, and I really think we should just keep that in mind as we're discussing a global conversation. Yeah, totally. All right, so Kabusi, um, you are born and raised in Africa. Yeah. Um, I was in Africa when I got an email from the White House to join the US CTO as a US CTO considerations. And one of the things that I think is really striking is there's a layer in the world, and Africa's an example, but everywhere. President Obama was going to Boise, Idaho. And we wondered, like in Idaho, how many tech meetups and incubator spaces and those things would there be there? Just like how many might be in any city, especially because I was in one of them when I got the email in Uganda in Africa. All around our world are these tech people who have these fluencies, whether they're in Gaza or whether they're in other places. There turns out there were 15 tech meetups in Boise, Idaho, including one with 800 people in it. And the girl development team was meeting twice a week. But no one in Boise knew that. And so the same thing, I think, is true everywhere we're working, where there's a layer of people who are fluent in tech and maybe choosing certain topics that they're working on, and people who just don't happen to be using this stuff. And so I don't know if you might comment about that dichotomy and what, we might, what you're finding is that we're able to do with that by bridging that and getting people to meet each other locally. Yeah, I would definitely say uh, when it comes to tech hubs in Africa, there's different flavors. Um, we have um, hubs that meet um, propagated by entities such as Facebook and Google. Uh, there's hubs for entrepreneurship that also collide with technology as well. There's hubs that look at nurturing talent to, uh, I guess, code, develop. Um, there's multiple efforts on the continent. Most of it is not really uh, grassroots upwards, which is the unfortunate thing. So it more or less aligns with an, ag with an agenda or an outcome that won't necessarily directly benefit um, the communities in which it is. Um, an example is, a uh, in Nigeria just recently, there was a, an e-commerce um, startup that recently had its um, ICO, but it's not headquartered in Nigeria, but it makes its money in Nigeria. All mm -hmm. the innovation is happening in Nigeria, but it's headquartered elsewhere and the money's going somewhere else. Yes, yeah, so this speaks to some of this public sector, you know, how do we get the data into the public areas and stuff. You guys have any comments on these kinds of topics we've been talking about? So, about um, so how to bridge these divides and how to protect ourselves from these surveillance governments. Um, to me, it feels like the only way is we are the ones we've been waiting for and we have to really team up and work across all our sectors. Elizabeth, you talked about government and, and you know, did the government have the will to do the specific building work, but this work here, this idea of teaming up on business model. Uh, you're talking about getting inside the companies themselves and having them flip. Any, any comments about 
I directions just, or coaching you'd give us all on yeah. like where your hope direction is. And I know we have almost no more time, so maybe we'll end up with those. That's, this is our last area of focus. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great opportunity to reinforce this concept of business model and making a business model that works really for everyone because there's a sort of cautionary tale here about the built environment. I mean, no one asks me any questions because maybe you're bored with hearing about housing or the built environment or you think that issue is done or solved because you sitting in this room, you're probably not worried about this building collapsing, are you? You're not. And so the built environment has, has evolved to serve the needs of a large majority of a population in a very positive way. But yet there are, you know, a third of the population that actually has to worry about that every day. And so I feel like there's an opportunity here for tech to make inclusive business models that really work for everyone, that sort of bring the regulation as well as the market forces, as well as the sort of just political will that's needed to really drive this forward in a positive process that, you know, 50 years from now, we don't all roll, roll our eyes on a conversation about, you know, AI because we think that's solved, but it's actually not solved for the majority of the, for the, majority of the population. And when you're doing the work, like the way you're doing it, it's not just for other people, but always design with. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. in the design chair is sort of everybody, especially so the people facing the hardest challenges because they have the most insights so the diversity of the team. Yeah. So I, I guess I have uh, one hope and fear with this discussion. So the hope is that we are having this dialogue, right? That the discussion about artificial intelligence and human rights is happening and lots of people are participating in that discussion. That gives me hope. Um, the fear is the fear of the bad actor. So I, I have a lot of belief in more inclusive business models, for example, and more open access to the benefits of innovation. Uh, but there's also this downside of if you make technology available, we're also making it available to bad actors. And how do we address that sort of misuse of technology and how it can be deployed for bad? That has to be in our minds as well as we're thinking about how it's used for good. And I was very taken by your conclusion right there at the end about how we think about AI for good and what needs to be in place for us to do that. Um, yeah, whenever I hear AI for good, I'm like, it's all the rest of it for AI for good. I always think it's all the rest of it AI for greed. Like, and yes, maybe it is. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, I, I spoke about Bletchley Park, right? That was some technology and organizing in a very evil way that in World War II that we had to fight against, right? So, so this is not new. This is not a new human issue. It's just our version of it, and it's really hard. Right? It's really hard. And I think it, it takes signal to noise work. And it really takes, remember the two a refugee camp versus Burning Man? You know, when I went into the United States government, I went back in time at least 20 years from my commercial experience of the physical tools I was working, which is ridiculous for that top talent and the, and the money in that government. Uh, and most governments are like that. And so we need the government and the public institution, our civic society, and all of our NGOs to get these kind of characters into your management team with you and start pushing these ways so that we can actually move to the, what you're kind of pulling us, what everybody's pulling us towards. I'll, I'll say one more hopeful thing and then yeah. that somebody said about naming and shaming or shaming. I mean, I think there's, we're just, we're waiting for a campaign. We're waiting for a clear campaign goal. It, you know, I think people will get behind something. I think people do want change and they want it to be systemic change and they want it to be respectful of rights and they want the benefits of technology and data to be for us, the people that at the moment giving so much and, and kind of left out of the, of the conversation. So I think, yeah, a campaign, a global movement, I think it's coming. One, one of the ways that we do a campaign with Shift 7 is, and we do it with United Nations Foundation who's here too, is we... Um, we scout, like we just did in the room, for who's already fixing things. Yeah. And we use the internet to do it. Tomorrow we're going to be teaching Solution Summit. We've been doing it, Susan Alsner here, uh, when she was at the UN, helped make it happen, is now in Chip 7. But we find these doers, like all of you, and we, we get like 1,000 submissions from 100 plus countries in two weeks when we ask off the UN site, who's fixing the SDGs already? promising or actual. Yeah. So we can also use the technologies and our crowdsourcing, our Wikipedia ways, to maybe try to see if we can get some collective genius on this stuff. And I really encourage all of us to keep thinking when you say, oh no, what are we going to do about, how do you go, I wonder who is doing something? Where are they? There's seven billion of us, so somebody's got something. And so I'm hopeful about our talent, if we can just hear each other and collaborate. Um, I think, are we out of time? Yeah. So there are a bunch of questions around. Can you just say what you were going to ask? Because you were like really stretching uh, just there. Yeah. 
Um, I hate that, if, uh, that I risk ending on a less hopeful note, but it, it was going to be that there's um, technology creates potentially different haves and have nots. Very much so. Right? And so youth, whom we think of as some ways have nots, in some ways in a technology space, maybe haves, in fact, because they've grown up and have a different experience of technology. And I, I think. I was thinking about it because some of your language for me is intimidating, right? I have to struggle to stay with you. What's tech? What's AI? Yep. How do I, as someone who's grown up professionally in government, so I'm familiar mm -hmm. with the, the systems you describe, how do I then make sure I stay with it and not just send you know, someone young on my team to a meeting about tech, right? Yeah, because we I, need your wisdom too. And so thinking about that difference in inclusion, which in some ways is non-intuitive, seems sort of an, another complicating but important factor. Yeah, you know, the picture that I showed with the 10th grader, with the police chief, one of the most promising, and you guys might have a couple, an example, let's show a couple examples of really promising things. Um, one of the things I love is when the thing that's the problem becomes the resource for the other thing. So today we have this idea that all the children have to learn STEM. And what, if you really think about how we teach, when you teach reading, we also teach writing. When we teach science and technology, you have to learn all this stuff, and you don't get to make anything until years later, right? Uh, so why don't we let keep kids express with STEM? And one of the really creative opportunities we saw out in Los Angeles, uh, there's a woman there named Jean Holm, who is Mayor Garcetti of LA's uh, innovation, and she's also a UCLA professor. And so she just started to use the data sets from the city, which were becoming open, as you said, these you know, public data sets, we have tons of them, for homework. So maybe you could work on your home during your homework. Uh, and so it was working, the students were really inspired and started to get more diverse set of students who were interested in any topic. I'd like to work on air quality in Los Angeles. I'd like to work on homelessness. I want to work on the transport issue. I want to work on garbage pickup. I want to work on animals, uh, shelters, whatever, poverty, food delivery. That's all data sets we have. It's really exciting. And so she created the Data Science Federation, Federation homage to Star Trek. And, uh, and any students can have this, and now many community colleges, UCL, US, USC, all have the data sets from the city in the homework in those schools, which makes it much less boring to learn STEM. And you're working on real problems. And then they team with the city team. So suddenly the city team, like you, would have these young people in your team, and you can go together to the meetings. And now there's 131 jurisdictions in Southern California behaving this way. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of thing we can do in this we are the ones we've been waiting for, and like put two and 10 together, and then story tell it so more people can share. And we can do that in any municipality. And we can take our scared blood pressure down, because it's really scary stuff, right? But it's not if we work together and we also you know, find each other. If you need a doctor, get a doctor. If you need a techie, if you need an operator, if you need a lawyer, team up. Any other thoughts came to mind for you guys it's around that? Yeah. Okay. okay, so go share, go scout for what's out there and tomorrow morning come to our breakfast and, uh, uh, on the Solutions Summit. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists for your key insights and your questions.